Sorry. Well, I just have a question. I mean, he he did not want to have any. He, did he not have a wanted want to have a discussion uh, with uh, people who are LGBTQ about you know honing in on his LGBTQ positions? Is is that what I'm hearing correctly? That, I mean, that was one of the things, you know, um, and, you know, I just, it, it, I, I know it was, he, he was just like, he didn't really want to engage with that, you know, particular issue. Um, and the um, overall, you know, besides that, Cornell was getting a lot of pressure to leave and go independent um, from, from some of his friends and family. Um, some close people that were close to him in politics, Nina Turner particularly, right? Um, and there were some people that were brought in to help Cornell's campaign that I, I wonder, if, you know, like there's this one guy that came in that was uh, from our revolution, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, a, a solid organizer, right? Supposedly. Um, yeah. But he came in and was throwing a lot of shade and really saying, oh, it's going to be so much easier to run as an independent. Ditch the Green Party, you know. And around that time, Peter Dow came in, right? Okay. And, um, you know, I've, I've got a lot of mixed feelings on Peter. Um, I, I am of the opinion to try to allow people, if they're changing for the better, to accept that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I was once a Democrat. Right. <laughs> and I got yeah, better. A lot of us were. Yeah. A lot of us were. Right. We had our evolutions. Right. As you kind of saying, you know, what brought you here? So, you know, mm -hmm. um, mixed, a lot of mixed feelings about Peter. But at that time, I really kind of held a lot of that on him. But I know that that more than anything, I, or I'm, I'm pretty certain if you and if you ask, like, maybe Savvy, she would kind of point this out as well. You know, the, the the biggest influencer on Cornell was his closest partner. So he is a Bernie Sanders uh, delegate representing Maine back in 2016. So former Bernie Sanders delegate, volunteer for the ranked choice voting referendum in 2016. He was Green Party co-chair from December 2018 to July 2020, national committee member from 2017 to now, member of the Committee for Smaller Shelters in Portland, Maine, in 2021, Maine and Green Independent Party Electoral Committee founder and chair from 2019 to 2023. I would like to introduce Mr. Justin Beth joining me today. Nice to have you on the channel. Hello, JB, and hello, everybody watching out there on all the, the various types of medias out there. And um, really um, grateful to be on your show, JB. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we, we quickly chatted. Um, I've been a fan of RBN uh, back before it was RBN and it was Fred Hampton left, leftists. Um, it really, um, and you guys put out such fantastic content and I love turning people on to you guys. Thank you, thank you so much. That means a lot. Justin, one of the things, I, first things I wanna get into and um, I have, uh, you know, uh, many people on throughout this entire duration of this channel. And one of the things that I've been talking about is people's journeys, their evolution. So uh, as the uh, former co-chair of the National Green Party, what landed you into that position and how did that evolution take place? Where did it start? Yeah. So, you know, I like a lot of people, um, I got really inspired back in 2015 with Bernie Sanders, right? I mean, it, it was just kind of caught fire. Um, and it was, it kind of harkened back to the um, Occupy movement, right? We were talking about the 1%, you know, and the 99% really, and um, trying to find our power, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I did everything I could for Bernie Sanders in Maine and New Hampshire, you know, on the ground, um, canvassing door to door, um, during the primaries, right? Um, phone banking. I, I learned so many skills of like those kind of practical skills that you need to be a, a good volunteer on these kind of campaigns. And not just candidate campaigns, but you can also use those skills for um, 
uh, ballot initiatives and other kinds of referendum and stuff like that that you're fighting for. Um, you know, and we, you know, we talk sometimes about like organizing at the workplace, but you know, there's also that other kind of organizing for these kinds of issues, uh, candidates and, and initiatives. So that really, you know, lit me off in 2015, 2016. Uh, I did, I did serve as a Bernie Sanders delegate, mm-hmm. and that opened my eyes to the DNC. And I was like, you know, it was it was a horrifying experience going. Uh, so I was at the um, the Wells Fargo Center down in Philly, and um, the first time I saw, kind of was in the same space as Jill Stein was there at the convention when she got in, <laughs> which was great. And, um, hmm. you know, I, I found then after, you know, that convention, and I helped on Jill's campaign in Maine, and I found my political home in the Green Party in, in Maine. And, um, you know, we have one of the strongest Green Parties in the country in Maine. Um, each state has different levels of activity and it, it's that could be a whole other segment on what what is this thing called the green party how does it function and where is it strong where is it not strong and um but you know um that really kind of uh, turned me on to it and when i um joined the green party in 2017 officially like registered as a green um and and in Maine, it's called the Maine Green Independent Party. Um, um, each state has its own names. In fact, in like West Virginia, it's called the Mountain Party. In Massachusetts, it's the Green Rainbow Party. Um, so it's it's kind of interesting that way. But um, I quickly, you know, showed to some of the people in the Green Party that I had some skills to offer. Being from the Sanders campaign, which is a really well organized machine right i mean bernie should have won that uh nomination yet the dnc denied it um so um but you know it was really a high-powered campaign and if people had gone from the sanders campaign to the green party and organized like they they did back with bernie i mean the green party would be a powerhouse we'd be electing candidates left and right um and jill stein would be a household name um, you know, but, um, you know, really exciting. I think people are really fed up with the the um, Democrats and Republicans now. I think, you know, the squad has kind of shown its failures, right? right. Um, I was very critical of our revolution and the squad, um, mm-hmm. brand new Congress back then, because um, <clears throat> I, I could see the writing on the wall that they were just going to kowtow and, you um, but yeah, so the the main Green Party, you know, kind of brought me in, and they 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 saw that I had a lot of potential. I got onto the national committee of the Green Party, and then um, there was an election, a special election to fill that co-chair. Um, the way the the Green Party works, right? There's a, it's actually like a nine-person steering committee with seven co-chairs and a treasurer and a secretary um, that that make up the steering committee so you know it's not like you're you're just alone there as a co-chair so um there's a lot to do and you know we're all volunteer none of us get paid for this and um it's a lot of work to try to you know keep certain committees going um and you know get out press releases and things like that um a lot of work and it's uh (laughs) it's a pretty thankless job but you know it it's valuable to those of us that really feel that we have something to offer, you know, and we, at the end of the day, we really want to, the thing we want to do is we want to make sure that people have a candidate on the ballot that they can vote for, that they feel good about voting for. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm currently in my car. I'm finishing a week, um, uh, or basically four days of canvassing down here in New York to get Jill Stein on the ballot. And that is the pitch that we make. You know, it's like, hey, are you a registered voter in New York? Do you want to to help get somebody on the ballot besides Biden and Trump in case you're not satisfied with one of those two candidates, you know, because they're going to be the only two candidates on the ballot here in New York if we don't get Jill Stein on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's um, it's it's something I truly believe in that we do deserve representative democracy and we don't have it right now at all. Um, And I think it's 
really important if we can to come together on a strategy for electing candidates, but also working on ballot initiatives and um, pushing in the streets, right? I, I do believe in protests, but I think the other part of that is we need a protest with a candidate. Um, and I think we could we could bring all those things together. Um, if we really truly organize together, we could be unstoppable. We really could. We have the numbers. We're just out organized as Malcolm X said. Yeah, and I appreciate that. But what is your summation of the progress in regards to the ballot access in New York? Because I know that that's one of the big, that's, uh, you know, yeah. Jill Stein is basically like Captain Ahab trying to get Moby Dick, you know, is basically <laughs> to get New York, you know. So how is that going in your opinion? Is, is there yeah. a, a little bit behind or are you a little bit ahead? I would say, uh, you know, we the I think we're we need to turn everything in by the 28th of May. So we really are in crunch time, and I know people are traveling all from all over the place into New York. I also know that people are really stepping up. Um, yesterday, I went to um, uh, so I pretty much the whole time been here on Long Island, um, canvassing at train stations, uh, metro stations, and um, which just yesterday I went to the Shelter Rock Community Center um, and uh, uh, Shelter Rock Islamic Community Center. And they were so receptive to it that, you know, it just like um, there is a um, young woman, um, uh, Malika, who uh, really was trying to connect uh, folks um, in the Islamic community uh, in the Muslim community there to to come out and and make sure that Jill Stein is on the ballot, you know, and and you know, rallying people to come um, and sign. So it was it was really encouraging to see, um, you know, they they understand that Jill Stein really is going to be the only person on the ballot, um, or the only chance to have somebody on the ballot that is, uh, you know, uh, supporting an end to the or you know, it wants to end the genocide going on in Gaza. Um, you know, she wants to end genocide also in the Congo, in Cameroon. Um, but so as far as the status of the ballot access, okay, which was your question, I, I um, you know, some people say, well, he didn't answer the question. So I would say that we're probably a little bit behind, but it's hard, really hard to say. Um, again, people have been stepping up. Uh, you know, I got 175 signatures in four days, which is pretty decent. I, I don't know if you've ever tried it. It's you got to have a lot of patience. Um, you got to yeah. you get turned down a lot. Right. Um, but you try to hook them and have a conversation. And for me, it's not just about the signature. It's about the conversation. I really believe in engaging with people and talking about what we're facing, like these crises, to, you know, we're facing Then do a little education. You know, have you heard of Jill Stein? What you haven't? She's amazing. And this is why, you know, you really need to know about her. Um, so the, um, but like, I would say like, you know, just roughly, um, you know, we need 45,000 minimum to get on the ballot. Um, and that was changed by, um, Cuomo when he was in office, you know, one of his last things was to really screw the green party over and other minor parties really increase the number of signatures needed. And, um, that's the, so 45,000 is the minimum. But, you know, typically the rule of thumb is to get twice the number that is the minimum because the DNC, you know, the Democratic Party is going to come in with a fine tooth comb and try to remove every signature that they can. Yeah. It, as many signatures as possible. So, um, you know, they tried that with Matthew Ho's campaign, right? But yeah. we fought it and we won. Um, so, you know, you want to build that cushion in. Um, we expect to lose some signatures to that, and that's fine. And some of them legitimately, you know, somebody forgot to sign or, you know, it, you know, they thought they were registered voter and they weren't, you know, or something like that. So legitimately, some of those signatures, you know, um, will come off. But the um, so I would say, like, you know, it, I, I mean, I really don't have any good numbers. 
the other thing I would say, you know, because a lot of people are like, oh, they're never going to make it. They're never going to make it. Um, one factor that hasn't really been talked about much is, you know, we have all the volunteers coming in, but we also have some paid canvassers out there. So the, the Jill Stein campaign is, you know, hire, hiring these paid canvassers. Um, they get it. Um, in some states, paid canvassers get uh, paid by the signature. And in New York, they get paid by the hour, um, which I think is is good, actually, because, you know, we believe in living wage jobs and it's a, kind of a job to go out there, although a lot of us are volunteering to do it, too. So um, the, these paid firms can get a lot of signatures and I expect that they do have a lot of signatures, but we just don't know about them yet. Um, yeah. And I. Um, I know that the person that is running the uh, ballot access coordination, a guy named Rick Glass, um, who did the, the ballot access work for Jill Stein in 2016, who was very successful that back then, because she was in the ballot in 45 states plus three as a write-in and could, got, could have gotten 522 electoral college votes. Um, he really knows what he's doing. Um, and... Um, you know, so I'm sure that the paid petitioners have a lot of signatures that we don't know about. Um, Rick probably has a, a good idea of where that's at. Um, I would say we're we're probably very close to the 45,000 we need, if not mm -hmm. already there. If you were to include the paid petitioners and what we have on Long Island or throughout New York, um, I'd say we're close to the 45, if not already there, but we really need to get that buffer, right? So, um, you know, this is not the time to stop canvassing. If you're out there, please, please keep going. And thank you. And, um, you know, this is a team effort. It really is, uh, JB. It's a beautiful thing to see. Um, believing in, you know, people deserving the right to have a candidate that represents their values. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that that happens for people. Yeah. One of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about is that, you know, ultimately, whether you are uh, somebody who's for an independent candidate, third party, it could be Libertarian Party, it could be Green Party, mm -hmm. it could be PSL, it could be di many different parties. The goal is really to expand democracy. We talk Absolutely. about expanding democracy across the, excuse me, across the world in this country over and over, talking about, oh my God, this country is not democratic in their eyes. But the thing is that we never talk about expanding democracy here. We never talk about yeah. expanding democracy True. in the workplace. We never talk about them expanding democracy yeah. when it comes to our, our uh, renters. We never talk about expanding democracy there. We never talk about expanding democracy in the places that matter the most to us here at home. Yep. And then also, why don't we ever right. expand democracy to the Supreme Court? So that's one of my things. I always talk about, people always want to talk about, oh, we need to expand democracy. I'm like, start in your own house first, baby. Yeah. Well, you know, um, one of the things with the Green Party, you know, there's, I, I hear, you know, uh, a lot of people are kind of fed up with poli party politics, right? And they expect that the Green Party, once we get into power, we're going to let people down as well. Um, yeah. You know, just like the, the Justice Democrats. Um, oh, by the way, um, I think I'm on the car Bluetooth, but it might be switching off in a second. Hopefully nothing interrupts the feed here just because I am in the car and it's doing something. Um, mm -hmm. anyways, um, the, um, oh, where was I? <laughs> Sorry. Um, the expanding democracy. So what we want to do in the Green Party, if we do get to power, is to change the way you know, elections work. Uh, we want uh, clean elections. We want to get the money out of politics. Um, in fact, I, a person that I worked with on the Ranked Choice Voting Campaign here in Maine in 2016, uh, a guy named Chris Kerr, uh, his partner is actually one of the deputy campaign managers for Jill Stein. Uh, oh, but this guy, Chris Kerr, is also working on um, nationwide effort with ballot initiatives to uh, basically overturn Citizens United, get money uh, money out of politics. Um, and uh, actually, I want to try to get him on some shows, uh, you know, maybe doing some interviews. I got him talking with Roger Meadows, 
Um, I don't know if they've had uh, additional conversations. Um, but um, yeah, that's really important to get money out of politics. We want to expand ranked choice voting right, mm -hmm. to every state for every election. We have it in Maine, but it only applies to certain elections. That's That could be another episode. <laughs> uh. um, but um, yeah, I mean, there's so many things we need to do to de expand democracy. And I love the way you talked about also expanding democracy in the workplace, mm -hmm. right? So the Green Party, we um, we talk about, you know, supporting worker co-ops, um, mm -hmm. which is, is democracy in the workplace. Um, you know, I am a big fan of Professor Richard Wolf, right? And many of us in the Green Party are. Um, and that's a, a big part of our platform. We, we see going, you know, for, for an eco-socialist party, uh, we believe in workplace democracy as the next step beyond unionization. Uh, you know, we do need unions and we need unionization. Um, and, you know, but, you know, again, like, again, you, it was so great the way you did that and talked about uh, democracy for, for tenants and, you know, uh, tenants rights. Um, no, it's it, absolutely right. We do need more, much more democracy here at home. In fact, I would say it's getting a little fascist these days, huh? Um, you know, uh, which, which, how do you like your fascism, red or blue? Um, you know? Yeah. Uh, see, none of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one so. of the things that I also want to talk about, we talked about this earlier, was uh, as far as a lot of people are concerned, a lot of people are asking about a unity ticket with people like Dr. Cornell West and Dr. Joe Stein. Uh, Dr. West has expressed uh, no desire. He talked to Brianna Joy Gray about it on Bad Faith, about no desire to uh, unite with Dr. Joe Stein, which in my opinion is, is quite sad. Um, you said that you had a little bit of knowledge about what was going on within the Dr. West campaign a little bit. So from further clarification, if you can give us a 30,000 foot uh, overview of what kind of what you know and what you can divulge without getting in trouble. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so early, you know, I was, of course, and by the way, is the sound coming through okay? Because it did transfer over to my phone now. So I'm it, not on the... It's fine. Mm -hmm. We can hear you. So good, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so... I did, you know, initially when when Cornell was um, seeking the Green Party nomination, um, myself and so many other Greens were very excited. You know, Cornell would have won our nomination very easily. Um, the complaints that he has that he, you know, was being pressured on LGBTQ um, trans rights issues or something like that. You know, that that was one of the things he was talking about. Like, you know, we we have, like I think Jill pointed this out recently with uh, an interview with jo Brianna Joy Gray, uh, maybe, that, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it was, our some of our Green Party members, that's a very important issue, right? Uh, one of our co-chairs currently is um, trans. And, um, you know, they want to have that dialogue and discussion, right? Um, they, they don't necessarily need Cornell to adopt their their position 100%. They just want to have the position heard by Cornell, hear his position, and have a dialogue. Um, you know, so it, it was, I found that to be a bit of a cop-out, you know, that was one of Cornell's complaints, right? That he, 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 did, he didn't like being pressured into the Green Party's positions on things. But really, again, we're a large party with a lot of different diverse viewpoints on many things. Uh, did you have a question or did you want to interject? Sorry. Well, I just have a question. I mean, he he did not want to have any, he, did he not have a wanted, want to have a discussion uh, with uh, people who are LGBTQ about, you know, honing in on his LGBTQ positions? Is, is that what I'm hearing correctly? That, I mean, that was one of the things, you know, um, and, you know, I just, I, I know it was, he was just like, he didn't really want to engage with that, you know, particular issue. Um, and the um, overall, you know, besides that, 
Cornell was getting a lot of pressure to leave and go independent um, from from some of his friends and family, um, some close people that were close to him in politics, Nina Turner particularly, right? Um, and there were some people that were brought in to help Cornell's campaign that I, I wonder, if, you know, like there's this one guy that came in that was uh, from our revolution, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, a, a solid organizer, right? Supposedly. Um, yeah. But he came in and was throwing a lot of shade and really saying, oh, it's going to be so much easier to run as an independent. Ditch the Green Party, you know. And around that time, Peter Dow came in, right? Okay. And, um, you know, I've, I've got a lot of mixed feelings on Peter. Um, I, I am of the opinion to try to allow people, if they're changing for the better, to accept that. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I was once a Democrat, right? <laughs> and I got yeah, better. A lot of us were, yeah. A lot of us were, right? We had our evolutions, right? As you kind of saying, you know, what brought you here? So, you know, mm -hmm. um, mixed, a lot of mixed feelings about Peter, but at that time, I really kind of held a lot of that on him, but I know that that more than anything, I, or I'm I'm pretty certain if you and if you ask like maybe Savvy, she would kind of point this out as well. You know, the, the the biggest influencer on Cornell was his closest partner, if you know what I mean. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, and you know, he's kind of hinted that like. You know, um, going after family, uh, you know, his family or something like that, you know, and um, the, the Green Party, you know, not, you know, and there, there, so there was like some difference, big differences of opinion, you know, with his, and his closest partner and um, Jill on, you know, like, again, like the whole campaigning thing for the nomination. Um, you know, Cornell did not want to be involved in any debates. Again, he would have won it easily. He would have won the nomination super easily, <laughs> but um, you know, just didn't want to participate. And again, with with all those people saying, "Oh, it's just going to be easier to go independent. Go ahead and go," you know. And Peter didn't really stop him or give him any pushback there. And then he made that decision, and it was a shock. I was actually canvassing in Arizona to get him on the ballot there. Well, not to get Cornell on the ballot, but the Arizona Green Party, which we got ballot access there. Um, so it was a shock to me. I was like out there collecting signatures for the Arizona Green Party. And again, you know, the Arizona Green Party got a bunch of signatures, not not nearly enough to really get the ballot access there. But um, that we had like the Cornell West campaign had paid canvassers getting signatures for the Arizona Green Party to have ballot access. And at the end of the day, we got the signatures we needed. Right. But then Cornell immediately left and abandoned the Green Party. And it's like, what do you do with all these signatures, Cornell? You paid for all these signatures for get the Arizona Green Party on the ballot. You're just going to give it up. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to go independent because it's so much easier. <laughs> Makes no sense. Makes no sense. These people you know, like Cornell didn't know anything about ballot access. These people advising him didn't know anything about ballot access. And meanwhile, you have the expert on ballot access, this guy, Rick Lass. And again, we, we did a, um, I did a couple of different interviews with Rick Lass talking about ballot access for Cornell West at the time. And, um, you know, to try to educate people on it. And, um, you know, Cornell just really made such a stupid decision with that. But, you know, again, he listened to the people closest to him. Right. And. Um, he, he felt that they knew better than the Green Party and the Green Party ballot access coordinator, you know, but so that's more or less, you know, it's, it's such a shame. And, you know, it's really sad to see Cornell double down on it and um, refuse, you know, Jill would have welcomed Cornell as a VP, right? And, you know, if, if it was possible, I'm sure that if Cornell sought the Green Party nomination again, um, it would be, it, it's really... It, it's not feasible at this point, but you know, she would have backed out of the race and give it just handed the, the nomination to Cornell, you know, it's, but really it's, it's too late at this point um, because of the way ballot access works. Cause I mean, we're getting Jill sign on the ballot here in New York and that's it, you know? Yeah. Uh, this is, um, this is a lot because um, as far as uh, what I, 
you know, understood. I, it, it feels like I'm trying to purse my words very carefully, but does it feel like it was a bit of a waste of your time when you were trying to get ballot access in in Arizona? And you, it kind of felt like because you had Cornell West as the the front runner of the Green Party, you basically had a wind in your sail in order to be able to carry you through, but. Do, do, is your opinion that when he left in the middle of you trying to get ballot access in Arizona, that that kind of deflated that win that you had behind you? Do you think that contributed to the ballot access, you know, kind of, you know, falling a little more flat than what you wanted? That it, There was definitely um, a kind of deflation. Uh, that's a, a, a good way to put it. You know, I was deflated, you know. When that, when it it definitely pulled the sail, uh, like the wind just dropped out of the sails for me. Um, I I kind of went into a bit of a funk. I was like, oh man, here we had a huge chance to really take it all the way and win big with the Green Party with Cornell West as our candidate. Um, you know, but that said, you know, <laughs> um, Jill stepped up to run, and you know. Again, it's it's just it's so messed up the way everything worked. But Jill was really, you know, was able to get prepared and get back in the race, you know, get it back and run again. Um, yeah. And thankfully, because it's about retaining ballot lines too for the Green Party. So it's, um, yeah, it was it was. Um, and then I felt that um, when um, Cornell made that statement about Navalny, right? Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, cringe, super cringe. That, that's a great cringy face you got there. Um, and um, yeah, it was so just, it was like, Cornell, don't, don't you know better? You know, um, it, it was just, uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't understand why you put him on the pet, like Navalny there on a pedestal with Leonard Pelletier um, and Mumia and others, others like, um legitimate political prisoners you know and um so i thought at that point i was like oh maybe we dodged a bullet yeah you know i and, we had uh leonard peltier's son uh joey peltier on a few weeks mm -hmm. back and now i would love to ask him that question what is your view of dr cornell west putting Novoni on the same pedestal as your father i don't think that joey peltier would uh be too happy about that. I don't think he was too excited about that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm only looking forward now at this point and, um, you know, what we can do with Jill. I mean, um, you know, and I think people are very excited. I think people see that the, the West campaign isn't really happening now and um, that this is really the, the best vehicle for us here or to have a candidate for, uh, against the wars and against the genocide and taking care of the problems we have here at home. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think somebody made a, a good point where they didn't want, they are trying to depress because uh, from what the Democrats did, especially the North Carolina Democrats did against uh, Matthew Ho, uh, of course, the Democrats in many different states, state Democratic parties are trying to do the same thing to the Green Party all over the country primarily because they don't want somebody like a Jill Stein to be on a national stage because they don't want a repeat of Minnesota, because they don't want a repeat of somebody like Jesse Ventura when Jesse Ventura, because it was said that Jesse Ventura, when he won, it was because his performance on a debate stage that won him the governorship of Minnesota. So unfortunately for the Democrats, if Jill Stein were to get on a debate stage and really challenge them, she would be uh, really a firebrand against people like Donald Trump, Joe Biden, and uh, RFK Jr. Because RFK Jr., in, in my personal opinion, is just a Democrat with an I next to his name. So she would also expose him as well. So uh, what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, Jill would really put them all to shame. I mean, somebody put a tweet out there um, talking about somebody needs to be the parent in the room at that debate. 
And, <laughs> you know, so, but the thing is, you know, somebody was asking about the debates thing and, um, you know, there's no way they're going to let her debate. Um, like CNN is recently talking about a debate in June, which is interesting, right? They're talking about a ba- debate between Trump and, and Biden in June. And that's before either of them really have the nomination of their parties. Yeah. Oh, I, Isn't that, I, that's sketchy, you know? Yeah. Doesn't they, don't they have to have the full nomination? Don't they have to be the actual nominee? You would All think the, so. You know, the delegates have to be counted first before that happens? You would think so. But somehow CNN's like, oh, no, no, we're going to just have the Biden and Trump on. Or any candidate that, that they say, you know, they use the same logic for the the other presidential debates. So the, the, the logic for the presidential debates on how to appear as a candidate for the debates is you have to have above 15% in an average of like four nationwide polls. Okay. You have to have uh, ac- ballot access to uh, more than 270 electoral college votes because that's what's needed to win the, okay. the election. Um, and then you have to meet the criteria of being greater, older than 35 and a U.S. citizen for president. Um, so that's what CNN is saying that they're using for criteria. And so somebody's like, oh, well, maybe they're leaving the door open for RFK Jr. because he's polling really well. Well, RFK Jr. doesn't have as much ballot access as Jill Stein. And he won't have the 270 electoral college vote access by the time the um, of this debate on June 20th. So it's like... This this debate with CNN's putting out it's it's really it's all sorts of sketchy again because I mean technically Trump and Biden don't have ballot access you know for the two hundred seventy because they're not the nominees yet for their parties it's yeah. just I don't know um, but so they're gonna keep Jill out of the debates you know she she won't be able to make it because of the polling right um, realistically um, I don't see her getting greater than fifteen percent. Um, I think it's key that we use our social media, right? Then the independent media to really get the word out there. You know, people are in some ways abandoning uh, mainstream media now. And yes. I think we really need to push as much as we can through social media and um, independent media. Yeah, uh, because ultimately, uh, from what we see as far as um, media, independent media, social, uh, especially now, we, we're at a point right now where the trust in the corporate media is at an all-time low. Um, you know, as a millennial, I, we, I consider us the streaming generation because we like to stream our news now. We're not sitting there, you know, we cut the cord from cable. We said absolutely no more. And now independent media is being stifled within the tube, I like to say, uh, especially in regards to uh, a lot of corporate media. And there are some channels, I'm not gonna say who, that are really just corporate media cosplaying as independent. And yep. so they will push the corporate media narrative left and right until you basically cave, until you're propagandized to think just like they do. So I, I honestly do agree. And some of these channels are really, really big and they got big really fast. And they're not channels like mine who <laughs> are trying to grow, but seems to be stifled in some way, but absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, and the Sorry. the prop the propaganda and gaslighting by our media is really disgusting you know it's it's really interesting i'm actually seeing some people out there that like listen to npr and they like uh, a, fr- a friend of mine you know that i went to college with you know she's like well i listen to npr a lot and you know they they're really good on what's going on with israel palestine and gaza right and getting it right and yeah, i'm like are you sh- sure? And she's like, no, no, that, you know, they're calling it a genocide and they're, they're speaking kind of favorably of the encampments. And I'm, and then, but then she's like, 
um, talking about Ukraine and how we really like we need to keep pushing back against Russia and that, you know, um, and, you know, what they're what's going on there. We can't just let uh, Putin come into Ukraine and then he's going to keep going, you know, pushing further um, west. You know, it's it's like so she's really like she's she's good on my friend is good on, you know, Palestine and, and saying that it is genocide and, you know, um, she finds it unacceptable, right? Um, and sees Israel as the the aggressor and the Zionist Israelis, right? Um, but she gets Ukraine wrong because NPR is telling her so, you know, it's, so the, the gaslighting, the propaganda is very strong, it's very persuasive. And, um, you know, that's another reason why I think it's good to go out and have conversations. You know, when I was doing this petitioning here in New York, again, I, I tried to engage in, in conversation as much as possible, you know, even in short windows. Um, you know, it's, yeah, we got to keep talking about these things and try to shut down that gaslighting and, and fight that the narratives that are being put out there by corporate media. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.